So once again, welcome to everyone. And I'm stressing the welcome, not just because I'm like that, but because I know there are all sorts of very interesting talks you could be at, but you're here, so thanks a lot for coming. Um, so I'm Martin. Ooh, things happening behind me. That's a bit disconcerting. I'm Martin and I work for the Bluetooth Special Interest Group and we are the standards organization behind Bluetooth technology. Um, importantly, we don't make things, we're not a manufacturer of any sort, we don't make products, we don't make commercial software, apart from a, a few tools people use to progress, progress their products through our uh, processes. I'm gonna talk about um, Bluetooth and location related stuff today, but, but largely because Bluetooth 5.1 core specification, to give it its full name, released earlier this year, around January, I think it was, has a new thing in it relating to location, which is quite interesting. So I'm, I'm kind of largely looking to talk about that. Don't know that it's necessarily in Linux at this stage because it's quite new, but history tells us that the Blue Z guys tend to adopt new Bluetooth features, so I'm hoping that we'll see it. But, you know, Hopefully you'll find it an interesting topic anyway. And if not, most of you at least got a sticker, which is my primary responsibility is sticker distribution. Anyway, let's make a start. So Bluetooth has been used for location-related stuff actually for quite a long time. I'm not sure it's the first thing people think of when they think about Bluetooth. It almost certainly isn't. Um, but we see the world of location-related services um, as depicted by the slide, possibly we got this from industry analysts, I'm not quite sure. Two major sort of groupings of use case, proximity solutions, per the name, all about being near to things and detecting that, and positioning systems, kind of to do with tracking things or determining their location in real time. Two specific examples under each of those headings, we've got item finding solutions, you know, where are my keys, I've lost them, oh no. Look at phone, oh, it's not far away, I'll go and find my keys and point of interest information solutions which tend to be related to either retail scenarios, you walk past or into a big store and you get told about things relevant to the department that you're in, or maybe you're in a museum or an art gallery, you get applications telling you about the exhibits in the room that you're in and so on, because you're close to something. Some kind of Bluetooth devices indicating where you are. And then the positioning system is to do with tracking things in real time, or indoor positioning, or wayfinding, or indoor navigation, whatever term you prefer, prefer, which is kind of about people knowing where they are and giving higher level kind of capabilities derived from that information, such as navigation in big, complicated buildings, maybe a bit like this one, maybe more like airports and stuff like that. So that's kind of how we break down the world of location. And the fact is, my laptop will behave. Come on, laptop. Please, thank you. The fact is we've had Bluetooth capabilities largely in the form of profiles that sort of fall under some of these headings for a long time. So we've got the proximity profile and the find me profile. They're kind of variations on the same thing. The find me profile is, is to do with finding lost objects that have tags connected to them, things like keys. Normally is the example cited and the proximity profile is like that, but it can do more than that. It kind of keeps you close to things you don't want to get far away from. Profiles, if you're not clear, are specifications that tell you how Bluetooth should be used in a given context for a certain product type. And we have the core specification, which is this is how Bluetooth works, how a Bluetooth stack works. That's the difference between the core spec and profiles. Profiles are about particular applications. We've got the indoor positioning profile, which per the name is all about being able to figure out where someone is indoors. But in the middle, the big success story, I guess, is not something which was standardized by the Bluetooth Special Interest Group or even invented necessarily by us, and that's the beacon. I mean, raise your hand if you know what a Bluetooth beacon is. That was rather than, you know, highlights the people who've never heard of beacons. But most of you have. So beacons are actually really simple devices. I think, you know, we can credit Apple with being the first to sort of drive the beacon, the beacon revolution. I sound like a marketing guy now. Um, so Bluetooth Low Energy has a capability called advertising. Like its kind of predominant purpose was to allow devices to be discovered. Really, it's connectionless broadcasting of small amounts of data. Packets are structured. You can't just put anything in there. There are some real rules to follow. But typically, a device will be advertising so that some other device can find it and connect to it. 
along came Apple, I think this is the story, and decided that they could put some other stuff in those advertising packets, not be concerned about things connecting. In fact, you don't have to allow connections to take place. And thus arrived on the scene this thing called iBeacon. So iBeacon is Apple's kind of message format, if you like, that sits inside Bluetooth advertising packets. And on the whole, it can basically contains a unique ID. So with an application on your, let's say, mobile device, you can be walking along and the phone starts to receive these kind of beaconing packets. The application will have a look at the unique ID, match it against a database of these numbers, and go, aha, we're in range of beacon number 1234, long number, therefore the user must be in this place. So that's how beacons work. And you know, by adjusting signal strength, you can make that more or less accurate. Low signal strength, you have to be pretty near to that beacon to receive its advertising packets. Stronger signal strength, you're gonna be further away and so the accuracy is, is lower, but you know, it depends what your requirements are. So Beacons arrived, uh, Google followed with their own format called Eddystone, and they're in all sorts of places now. One of my local airports in London has something like 2,500 Beacons deployed in it, and some services for phones provided by the airport authority that run that airport. So Beacons have been uh, quite a success, really, and uh, perhaps the best known of the location services that Bluetooth has today. However, one of the limitations is that if I receive an advertising packet from a beacon of some sort, let's say on my phone, all I know is that it's somewhere in range. It could be behind me, it could be it's over there. I don't know anything about where this thing actually is. Likewise, with the earlier sort of generations of things like key finders, I don't know what direction these things are in. I only know that I'm somewhere near to them. And so the gray area on my slide kind of tells me, you know, that, that I'm somewhere in that, that kind of donut shape but I really don't know where on that circle I am because I've got no way of knowing the direction that that signal is coming from. If I did, then I'd have a much better idea of where I am, per the thrilling slide, what I made. So things like you know, item finding, I've lost my keys, become quite amusing and remind me of a game I used to play as a child. I'm always wary of, kind of volunteering this personal information to, to complete strangers in case you're thinking, what a weirdo. <laughs> What was he doing, <laughs> spending his time doing that sort of stuff as a child? But we did used to play a game where a thing would be hidden. You'd have to try and find it, and friends or family would be saying, warmer, warmer, as you got closer. Colder, cl colder, if you walked in the wrong direction. Tell me, did anyone else play this game? Or was it just, I'm amongst friends. Fellow weirdos, perhaps. <laughs> and that's how things work with the kind of current generation of key finder things. You know, you, you really don't know what direction you're in, but you'll have an application that will be using color coding or something to tell you, you know, you're walking in the wrong direction, so you'll walk back and eventually you'll find the thing. But if only we knew the direction the signal from the key finding tag was being transmitted from, we'd walk straight towards it, much better user experience. And in fact, with direction, new things become possible as well. So one of the use cases we're uh, thinking about and anticipating um, kind of arriving on the scene in mobile applications is what we call directional discovery. So you point your phone at specific things over there and you get information about those specific things because your phone, plus the Bluetooth direction finding capability I'm gonna to talk to you about, knows what you're pointing at rather than I'm in a room full of paintings by Picasso or someone French even, Renoir, I don't know. Um, you know, I'm pointing at that specific painting so I get information about that. So new things become possible with direction finding. And that's precisely what the Bluetooth 5.1 specification delivers, a new capability that allows data from which very precise angles can be calculated. So you can build all sorts of new products and applications. So I'm now gonna talk about that and start here. So, in terms of methods, and kind of architectures, there are two ways in which you can use this new Bluetooth technology to arrive at an angle which tells you where a signal is being transmitted from. The first is called angle of arrival. And in angle of arrival, the receiving device has more than one antenna. It has an array of antenna, an antenna array even. We could say it that way. Whereas the transmitter just has one. So the transmitter's transmitting a special signal called a direction-finding signal. I'll tell you more about what that really is 
in a few slides' time, but this other device has an antenna array and through some magic can use that to figure out directions. There is, of course, no magic. Nobody's crying, that's good, you're all engineers, so I'll talk to you about the stuff that isn't magic as well. So the other way of doing this, if there are architecture, is angle of departure, and it's the transmitting device that has the antenna array, and it's the receiver that has to figure out the direction the signal's coming from, using data that's in the signal and some knowledge it has of the transmitting device. Those are the two fundamental choices available to you. This one we see being used as you know, the basis for indoor positioning systems, so those you could almost think of as um, you know, beacons generation two, almost indoor GPS with devices installed all around airports and big buildings. You're walking along with your smartphone that only has one antenna in it, but thanks to the angle of departure capability, it can figure out where that signal's coming from. Therefore, that beacon is, is, is over there, and we can get much more precise locations calculated accordingly. An antenna array is kind of outside the scope of this um, talk and, and very much outside my, my knowledge as well, but they come in various shapes and form, as you can see. And the, these are kind of implementation decisions that manufacturers who are into the hardware side of things will be left to figure out for themselves. Accuracy, of course, is a question um, about this kind of thing. So if we go back to generation one beacons, those things that just broadcast a kind of unique number, I beacon, Eddystone, whatever they are. Um, you know, you read different reports about how accurate people believe their solutions to be, but from my own personal experimentation, I'd say, you know, you, you're kind of pushing it, you know, to get better than a couple of meters accuracy. And, you, you know, again, you don't know anything about direction, but you can use signal strength and a path loss calculation to estimate how far you are from something. So still within that donuts region that I talked about, there's still quite a, a significant margin of error, which might not matter. It all depends on your requirements. It's all about fit-for-purpose solutions, of course. With the new direction-finding capability, though, you can get way better results. And you know, we have companies we know who are already using the techniques I'm in the process of describing to you, and they will tell you they get 10 centimeter accuracy under the best conditions. Lots of variables inside buildings, materials and walls and stuff all can have an impact on just how accurate you can be, but that leads you into a whole kind of design methodology for your system as a whole, as opposed to the stuff relating to the technology, which is my field. The potential, though, is there to get very, very accurate, and you know, calling it indoor GPS actually seems quite a reasonable idea. It's way better than GPS, in fact, in terms of accuracy, if I remember my GPS figures correctly. So one thing to know, um, make sure you've got on screen what I've got on screen, suddenly paranoid that you're not seeing what I'm seeing. Um, one of the things, one of the tricks of the trade, if you like, is this. In some solutions, um, you will deploy direction finding beacons around your buildings. They'll have a two-dimensional antenna array in them. And one of the things you'll do from things like smartphone applications or whatever other de or devices you're tracking is calculate two angles from that one signal. You can calculate a signal which is relative to a horizontal plane, okay, and an angle which is relative to a vertical plane, because these things will be on the ceiling. Okay, so I know it's over, over there towards the AV guys, but I also know it's, it's up there. So you end up with two lines, and where they cross, that's where we get the most accurate kind of calculations of angle, where those two um, kind of signal directions cross in space. So I want to tell you how this stuff works, because that's where, of course, it always gets interesting. Uh, who studied physics at school or college or what have you? Got a few physicists in, in, in the audience. That's quite worrying. Um, <laughs> who's seen the TV show The Big Bang Theory? Uh, Le Theory... Grom, I don't know. Um, who did French at school? Me, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so you, you all know enough physics here because we actually have to drop down into the world of physics to understand how this stuff works. The fundamental basis of Bluetooth's direction finding capability has been around since the middle of the last century. Radio communications has been around since the 1890s, of course. So we haven't invented this technique. We're standardizing the way that it should be used with a Bluetooth radio. So here we go. Oh, waves. 
could have shown particles, of course, but for our purposes, we need to consider radio energy to be waves, okay? Again, you've all seen Big Bang Theory, which is great. So as you know, waves kind of look like that. They are repeating. Let's say they're all sine waves. They kind of go up and then down, and then that repeats. That's called a wave cycle. And they, there is a wavelength. Wavelength is not an abstract idea. It is a physical length. Bluetooth, the wavelength is around 12.5 centimeters, but it depends on the frequency. The wavelength will vary according to the exact frequency being used, and Bluetooth use, uses lots of different frequencies. 74 when two devices are connected with a Bluetooth low energy link. So lots of different frequencies involved. The wavelength will vary slightly according to the one in use at a particular time. We hop around, do lots of different frequencies through a process called adaptive frequency hopping. Another concept for you to know as we lead towards understanding how this works is phase. This is a really important one. So consider a wave passing across an antenna at any point in time, we are part way through that wave cycle. We may be exactly at the start, in which case we say the phase is zero. It's measured or expressed as an angle. Maybe we're halfway through it, in which case we'll say we are pi radians. The phase is pi radians, or it's 180 degrees, depending on your preferred units of measuring angles. So it's 360 degrees is a full cycle of your wave. Got it? Physics lesson. Didn't know this was going to happen, did you? The doors are locked. We're good. So, for a given fixed frequency, which therefore gives us a fixed wavelength, the following becomes true. If you imagine a transmitter in a fixed location, and it's transmitting, sometimes tempting to think of you know, radio transmissions as kind of going, you know, we're, we're kind of transmitting from here to here. In actual fact, it's more like dropping a stone in a pond. The energy is, is ripples resonating outwards from the point of entry of that stone in the pond, same with radio communications. If we place two antenna, two receiving antennas, at exactly the same distance, or rather on the circumference of one of those ripples, they are therefore exactly the same distance from the transmitter. Agree? My ripples are circular, okay? That's basic geometry and maths. Consequently, if I was to measure the phase of the wave as it passes over those two antennas at exactly the same time, I'll get exactly the same value because it's the same wavelength, because it's the same frequency. Therefore, I absolutely must get the same phase value. And this becomes useful because wavelengths, we know, around 12, 12 and a half centimeters, if I'm halfway through that wave cycle, in other words, my phase is pi radians, 180 degrees, that's 6.25 centimeters from the beginning of the wave. Suddenly, we've got a way of deriving distance information from transmitter from this phase thing. And again, this stuff comes from the beginning of last century, okay? We didn't just make it up. Sorry, come on, laptop. It's refusing to work. So if we look at it on its side, it kind of looks like this. So, oh, I know why. It's because I did something wrong there. What an amateur. So next stage in the explanation, had I not done it wrong, is this. If I move one of my receivers so that it's a little bit nearer to the transmitter, as long as I do that by a delta that is not an exact multiple of the wavelength, then if I measure the phase at exactly the same time on the two, at the two antenna, I'll get a different value now, okay? Agree? Makes sense? Lots of nodding, please. Okay, there will be a test. And if we look at that sideways on, it kind of looks like this, okay? So if one of my antenna is X from the transmitter, we'll get a phase value of pi. If another one is further away, that's my distance Y on the slide there, I'm gonna get three pi over two, I have to check that one, three quarters of the way into the, the wave cycle. You get the idea. This information becomes useful for us and is the basis for calculating angles because if I have multiple receivers, and with an antenna array, that's what's going on in my system. The calculation of angles becomes basic trigonometry. Now, I'm not going to, I mean, you'll, you'll run screaming from the room if we go into the, the formula on screen here, but that's copied and pasted from the Bluetooth core specification. We all did trigonometry at school, I guess, apart from you guys that did arts, nothing but arts, but then changed course in later life. Right, so trigonometry is not difficult maths. So that's the whole purpose of this slide. Under the hood, there's some phase difference related calculations going on. 
using some basic trigonometry, we can now derive an angle. And that's what we're looking for. That was the holy grail. Now, one further thing to tell you. What is it that's measuring these phase values from radio waves flowing over antenna? Well, the process is called IQ sampling, which I'm guessing most of you have heard of. Who's heard of IQ sampling? Approximately 52% of the room. Very good. So IQ sampling, I think, is used in lots of applications. It's probably used in audio, isn't it? Sampling of certain sorts is. It's just measuring amplitude and phase values from some form of signal at certain intervals. So our IQ sampling is the process that the Bluetooth stack will use if it's asked to, to start to measure phase and amplitude values from signals incident upon its antenna. That, that's what's going on behind the scene. Now, this stuff is, I would acknowledge, because I was perhaps where you are today um, a year ago, a nightmare to visualize, is it not? It's hard enough to explain in words, never mind pictures. So, me being me, I, I did decide I really need to see what was going on and visualize this stuff. So I wrote something to help me kind of understand what on earth was happening here. And you can't see it because PowerPoint still has, I wondered why. Oh, actually, it's not PowerPoint. AV team, I have a slight problem. Could you please make my web browser appear on screen? Is it? Ah, it's because we have an extended monitor going on here. Oh, computers are such a nightmare. I know it's, oh dear, excuse me. Mouse control problems now. Or Windows doing annoying things. Oh, don't do this. So I'm going to talk to myself, and you're going to hear it all on the mic, which should be music. Oh, this is a real pain. I don't know if I changed a single like not extended monitor, whether I'm going to break the entire AV setup. Well, I'm going to do it anyway. And if you don't get to see my amazing um, visualization thing, then that's just unfortunate, really. Uh, maybe that might work. I'm like an AV guy's nightmare now, doing this live on stage. Does that work? I really shouldn't have done this. Now let's try two then. I know, we should have tested this. Yeah, I can't even see this now. Let's revert. Yeah, I think you're going to have to just imagine my incredible visualization, which is a shame because it really is quite remarkable. Duplicates, will that work? Who knows Windows? I don't know what I'm doing. Oh, promising. Let's kill that. Let's go to here. Yes. God, I hate computers. <laughs> so, let's pretend none of that happened and that none of it was videos. <laughs> Please edit that out. So, what we've got here then is, um, it's just a web page actually in some JavaScript I kind of knocked up. So, we've got, the white thing is meant to be an antenna. We have a radio wave passing across it, massively slowed down from the speed of light. The red number and the blob is the radio phase varying from 0 to 360 degrees, okay, as the radio pa wave passes over it. If I add another antenna and another, and because I've carefully placed my antenna at distances that are not exact multiples of the wavelength, you can see that I'm getting different phase values at a given point in time. Can you all see that? After all the trouble I went to, <laughs> please say yes. Now if I switch on IQ sampling, this is what's going on. If you watch the yellow number, that's me sampling from this antenna, then this antenna, then this antenna. I'm kind of moving through my antenna array according to a strict sequence and timing, and I'm sampling values from each antenna as the radio wave passes over it, okay? That's fundamentally what's gonna be going on in the Bluetooth stack when you enable the direction finding stuff. Let's move back to PowerPoint, which I've decided is in fact my friend. There we go. So, you have a good mental image now. So there's one other thing to know about. So, we're relying here 
on using phase measurements and their correspondence with wavelength to give us distances from which we can do some trigonometry which gives us an angle. That's kind of the building blocks of how this system works. But there is one other issue. I mentioned that we use lots of different frequencies. So when two different devices, Bluetooth devices, are connected, they do something called adaptive frequency hopping. There are 37 radio channels that they will hop through, but a channel is a frequency range. It's not a frequency, it's a range of frequencies. Radio is analog, but we need to encode digital information in it. This is where modulation schemes come in, and the way it works with Bluetooth is this. Here's my channel with a lower frequency and upper frequency. Somewhere in the middle of those two things, there's a kind of central baseline frequency. So we define something called a frequency deviation, which is a number. To represent a zero, we subtract the frequency deviation from that central frequency. So frequencies less than that central value represent zero. To represent a one, we add the frequency deviation, whoops, I keep doing this, to it, okay? So we do change the frequency within a channel to represent our ones and zeros from the digital world, okay? That's how it works, which is great, but for direction finding, of course, we need to know what the wavelength is. It kind of needs to be static. We can cope with the frequency deviation thing, but it complicates things a little bit. So I've used the phrase direction finding signal. These are signals which have appended to them some special data, which essentially is a load of ones. They're all ones, therefore the frequency stays the same, therefore the wavelength is a static quantity we can do our sampling on and derive our direction calculations from. That's what we do here. So that special thing is called the CTE, the constant tone extension. If it was audible, it would be a constant tone. I'm not, I'm not gonna do it, don't worry. Mm, it's like that though, okay? And direction finding signals have a CTE appended to them, and this is all defined in the Bluetooth 5.1 specification, you can see. Those of you, who here is familiar enough with Bluetooth to know what packets look like and stuff like this? Some of you for sure, yeah, okay, so just gets tacked on the end after the CRC, okay? You know about whitening? We don't apply whitening to the CTE because that would kind of mess it up, okay? So, let's talk about where this is in the Bluetooth stack. Now, you've had all the, the, the physics, the Big Bang Theory stuff. Um, let's go back to Bluetooth now, which we kind of had started to do. So, there are various configurations of Bluetooth stack that you can use, so your smartphones have a stat that looks like this, control a component at the bottom which sits on top of the radio itself, other layers in the host components on top of that, the one you're seeing now which is GAP, GAT and AT is, uh, plus some other layers, it's what phones use to talk to peripheral devices like activity trackers and smartwatches and, and, and so on. I talked about Bluetooth mesh this morning, if you're in that talk you'll know that we have an entirely different host stack that sits on top of the Bluetooth low energy controller when you're doing mesh communication. Mesh and direction finding are not related at all at this stage. So the stuff we've delivered is only about the stack configuration on the left. Now, in terms of what we've delivered so far, which is my, ooh, my hint that there's actually a little bit more to come, we've delivered core specification version 5.1. It only defines what's going on in the controller. It's all stuff to do with IQ sampling and the timing of IQ samples. We're talking about one or two microsecond timing slots here, very precise timing rules. But we've also defined, if you see sitting in the middle there between the host and the controller, we have a layer actually an interface called the host controller interface, which per the brilliantly selected name is how the host part talks to the controller part and sends it commands and, and receives things back from it called events. So we've extended the host, host controller interface so that the host can say to the controller, I want you to start giving me direction finding signals. In other words, I want the constant tone extension, please. And here are some parameters to do with timing and stuff like that. The host can tell the controller what it wants. Once it's done that, the controller will start to perform IQ sampling depending on which end of the sort of relationship between transmitter and receiver we are, but essentially that's what we're gonna do. Configure the controller and then enable 
sampling or the processing of samples. So here's an example. You can use this in either connection-oriented situations where two devices are connected or connectionless, so where one device is advertising, so that's connectionless broadcast of data and other devices are scanning for information. They're just, there's no synchronization of the timing of these operations. You can use Bluetooth direction finding in either of these two scenarios, okay? The way it works differs, of course, and in fact, you're gonna need to have a Bluetooth 5 stack to be able to use this in, um, sorry, let me start again. You've gotta have a Bluetooth 5.1 anyway for direction finding, but we're leveraging something that became capable, uh, possible in Bluetooth 5, which is advertising that has kind of agreed timing, if that doesn't sound like a contradiction in terms. Before Bluetooth 5.0, all advertising just, just happened according to the frequency you told it to happen to, and devices that wanted to receive advertising packets just had to try their best to you know, be listening when they were being transmitted, and if they weren't listening when they were transmitted, they wouldn't receive them, so there was no way of synchronizing the two. Bluetooth 5 actually lets you do something called um, periodic advertising, where the timing is agreed, or is actually broadcast to other devices. So I'm gonna advertise every 200 milliseconds and all the other devices are, okay. Right, I'll start listing at the right interval. And because of the timing specific nature of the direction finding and IQ sampling stuff that's going on, the connectionless communication, that's what you have to use. What's shown on the slide here though is a sequence diagram of the connection oriented situation. Not gonna go through the detail here, but essentially there are some new host controller interface commands that lets the um, the two hosts talk to their controllers and switch on IQ sampling, maybe give some parameters, and then across the link, um, there's a PDU called uh, LLCTE rec, so that's LL is the link layer. CTE, of course, you already know is constant tone extension, well done, class, fantastic. And obviously request is me sending something down the link saying please reply with something containing uh, constant tone extension, so something's taking place, <coughs> excuse me and I'm gonna get a response to that. What you actually get back across the host controller interface are not individual samples, because we're talking about microsecond timing slots now, but I'm actually gonna get an array of IQ samples of amplitude and phase measurements. After which, at this stage, because we still have some profile specifications to release, it's over to you. So. A lot of responsibility still in the host and application layers to decide what to do with that raw material. The very basics are quite straightforward. There's that trigonometry formula in the spec, so you're gonna kinda use that. I think we're never gonna go too far in defining exactly how you do the calculations to derive direction finding from different designs of antenna array. We see that as a place where competitors can kinda get the edge over each other, okay? But that's where we are right now. So, that almost ends the talk. Let me tell you where you can go next if you want to know more. In terms of actual stuff on market, this is still really, really new. I haven't really been watching to see what devices are out there. There are, well, I'm gonna say there is at least one developer board that comes with an antenna array that lets you start to develop Bluetooth 5.1 direction finding stuff. There may be, in fact, I heard about another one at lunch, so may, there's maybe several out there now. That will accelerate, that's what normally happens n months after the release of spec, there's nothing, because people are implementing or still planning, and then you start to see stuff arrive, and then it accelerates, so. What can you do? Um, you could read the core spec. It's only 3,000 pages, oh, go on. You don't need to read all of it, of course. But we do have some other stuff which um, we try to position as educational resources for developers and other technical roles which will help bridge you into the spec. The spec can be cha challenging sometimes, it's certainly big. Um, so if you go to bluetooth.com, www.bluetooth.com, not hard to remember, click on resources, you'll find that we've got lots of stuff in there. We've got papers which are for reading, like the stuff on screen, and things we call study guides, which will give you hands-on experience as well. We don't have a study guide for direction finding yet. That will doubtless come as developer boards hit the market. Um, the technical overview on the left is probably the place to start. Good summary of what it's all about. And there's some other stuff. Some of it from third parties as well. The one on the right's by uh, Silicon Labs, who are uh, a member 
of the Bluetooth Special Interest Group and maker of Bluetooth stuff. And that, my friends, is all I have to say to you on the subject of Bluetooth and location services and direction finding. Thank you for listening. I hope that was all right. Enjoy the sticker, if not.